Welcome to Monsters in the Family, the assassination of little Gregory Villemain, a multi-episode series brought to you by Bed Crime Stories Podcast and Carnage Street. I'm your host, T, and this is episode four, The Immediate Aftermath. If you haven't listened to the three previous episodes in this series, I suggest that you do that first. They contain much-needed background information that will help you understand who the key players in this case are, as well as the events that led up to four-year-old Gregory Villemain's death. As soon as news of the crime hits the TV and radio stations in France, on the evening of October 16, 1984, Every media outlet in the country sends reporters and photographers to the small villages of Les Ponges and Dossel in France's Valley of the Vallone. The stark black and white photo of a fireman cradling little Gregory's tied and bound body in his arms, juxtaposed with a colored school photo of a smiling, radiant Gregory in life captures the French people's attention. The normally quiet villages are soon inundated with aggressive outsiders willing to climb over private walls and through flower beds to knock on residents' doors in an attempt to get the scoop of the day. Annoyed villagers tell the pushy journalist to allez-vous-en, go away, but the pleas are ignored. The crime quickly becomes as big in France as the Jean Benet Ramsey case in the United States and the Madeleine McCann case in the United Kingdom. Why? Simply answered, because the Gregory Villemain case has all the ingredients of a hot news story. A beautiful child victim. Young photogenic parents. A mysterious crow communicating ominous threats via anonymous phone calls and letters. An extended clan peppered with colorful characters, dark secrets, and epic family feuds. It's the stuff of a lifetime movie, except that it's all real. L'affaire Grégory, as it is called in France, eventually becomes the subject of some 3,000 newspaper articles, 50 university research projects, a television movie, and 15 books, according to Le Parisien newspaper. The French people are shocked that such a brutal crime occurred in a bucolic country village, a peaches and cream kind of place, with simple, hard-working laborers, where everyone knows everyone. Hearing that the crime was most likely committed by a family member is la pièce de résistance, the icing on the cake. Everyone is wondering how anyone could hurt an innocent four-year-old, let alone one that he, she, or they are related to. A photographer slash journalist named Jean Kerr from Perry Match magazine, which is the People magazine of France, even sweet talks his way into Jean Marie and Christine Villemain's House on the Hill early on and manages to get the prize turkey photo of little Gregory, his last school picture. In it, we see the little boy's infectious smile and tussled curls. Gregory's energy leaps off the page, cheerful, not a care in the world, fun-loving. These qualities make little Gregory the perfect fodder for tabloid print. When Jean Kerr asks Gregory's father, Jean-Marie, if he knows who killed his son. Jean-Marie replies in a breathy, adrenaline-tinged voice, I know who it is, but I will not say. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. End quote. The investigators trace the crow's steps from Christine and Jean-Marie's house on the hill, where Gregory was nabbed, to the spot along the river where they initially believed the child was placed in the water, and then on to the location about 2.5 miles downriver in the neighboring village of Dossel, where the body was found. After throwing a mannequin that's been custom made to mirror Gregory's height, weight, clothing, and bound 
hands and feet into the Valone River from the spot in Les Pange where the police originally believed the child went in, the military police conclude that Gregory must have been thrown instead into the Barba, a stream that runs into the Valone River in the neighboring village of Docelle. The police focus on a somewhat secluded spot just behind the Docelle fire station. When they throw the mannequin into the water from that point, it makes its way straight to where Gregory's body was found, up against the dam. The mannequin also turns up in the same condition as Gregory's body did, meaning without any scratches, with its clothing perfectly intact, there are no tears or snags on the coat or pants from overhanging tree branches. Note that when the police throw the mannequin into the Valone River in Les Ponges, it always gets stuck in tree branches arching over the water, and it is unable to make its way to where Gregory was found in Docelle. The location in Docelle, behind the fire station, makes sense, too, as it would have been a less risky spot for the perpetrator or perpetrators to commit the act on the day of the crime. Remember, no one, no police officers, no firemen, no family members were searching in Docelle for Gregory around the time the body most likely was thrown into the water. On the day of the crime, at around 6 p.m., the police were only beginning to search for Gregory, and all their efforts were taking place over in the village of Les Ponge, either at the Villemain's house on the hill or down along the banks of the Valone River. Also, don't forget about that lady in Docelle, Madame Gouillot, who saw what she assumed was a blue plastic bag of garbage floating in the water there a little before 6 p.m. on October 16th. Madame Gouillot later realized to her horror that what she saw was not garbage. It was little Gregory. It's only after Gregory's body is found in Docelle that the police realize that the riverbank there is the likely crime scene. When the police scour the riverbank in Docelle, they discover tire marks in the mud from what they believe to be a Renault 4L car. They also find two sets of shoe prints, one male, one female. It's looking like the perpetrator may have had help on October 16th, so not one monster in the family, but at least two, and maybe more. Imagine that, one family in which more than one person is mentally unhinged enough to take the life of an innocent four-year-old child. Does something run through the bloodlines? Some madness that's been undiagnosed for generations? One has to wonder. On November 9, 1984, so 25 days after the crime, as the police continue their search along the riverbank in Docelle, they discover a hypodermic syringe and an empty insulin box. Those findings lead them to theorize that perhaps the perpetrator injected Gregory with insulin to put him in a diabetic coma. Knocking the child unconscious would have made it easier for the perpetrator to tie him up. It would also help to explain Gregory's serene expression when Dr. Petit, the first medical professional to examine the body, removed Gregory's wool cap from his face. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the day after Gregory's death, October 17, 1984. That's the day when Gregory's official autopsy is performed in the city of Nancy, France. Forensic pathologists Dr. Gérard de Rennes and Dr. Elisabeth Pegel work together on the body. They are observed by two military police officers and 32-year-old Judge Lambert, who will be the judge of inquiry on the case.
like Dr. Petit, Drs. Duren, and Pagel, note right away that the body has no lesions and no defense wounds. They agree that it looks as though Gregory did not wrestle or struggle against the cord that bound his wrists and ankles. When the pathologists remove Gregory's scalp, they find one small bruise on his skull. When the doctors examine Gregory's stomach, they note a small amount of water as well as residue that looks like small chunks of apple, Gregory's last snack. The doctors take blood samples and part of a lung. However, the small quantity of blood they take will later prove insufficient to establish a complete toxicological assessment. This is just one of the many poor judgments that will occur in the case. The blood sample taken is only large enough to show that Gregory did not have any alcohol in his blood. Testing of the lung sample reveals a small amount of water in the lungs. Doctors Duran and Pagel also note the following. A large moss fungus present in Gregory's mouth and nostrils. Apparently this fungus is seen in bodies of those who have died recently and in whom air has mixed with water. The fungus indicates that the person either breathed under water or on the surface of the water. Gregory's lips are blue. This indicates asphyxiation resulting from a reduction in oxygen carrying hemoglobin in the blood. The lungs are distended and marked with numerous spots of something called tardieu. Tardieu generally appears in the tissues of people who have been strangled or otherwise asphyxiated. Just FYI, deaths from asphyxia are classified either as being the result of suffocation, strangulation, or chemical asphyxia. The lower airways, that is the bronchi and bronchioles, are filled with hydroaric spume, a foamy looking substance. There is also a small amount of this spume in the corners of Gregory's lips. Note that the presence of this foam in and around the mouth is one nonspecific finding that could lead to the conclusion that a person may have died by drowning. The right atrium of the heart contains liquid blood as opposed to dried blood. This indicates the person died recently. The liver and kidneys are congestive. Fluid has accumulated in them. This is another nonspecific finding that could indicate drowning as a cause of death. After they finish the autopsy, doctors Durin and Pagel conclude that Gregory died of submersion asphyxia followed by submersion inhibition, which may have resulted from the body suddenly coming in contact with very cold water. These two occurrences in that order led to respiratory arrest followed by cardiac arrest. If you find this wording confusing, you're not alone. That's the best I can do. I'm obviously not a pathologist, but I wanted to give you the information as worded in the autopsy. Remember, I'm translating French into English to do this. Now, this is where rumors of Gregory being thrown alive into the Valone River come from. The pathologists believe that Gregory breathed in some water, but very quickly experienced respiratory arrest due to hydrocution. Hydrocution means cold water shock. Cold water shock can lead to cardiac arrest and or drowning. This could also explain why Gregory's body floated on the surface of the water. In a death by hydrocution, the presence of air in the lungs prevents the body from sinking. Some experts find Dr. Durin and Dr. Pagel's conclusions about Gregory's cause of death absurd, arguing that a person cannot die a little from this and a little from that as in a little from asphyxia and a little from drowning. 
it's either one or the other. Doctors Durin and Pagel fail to do two critically important things during the autopsy through no fault of their own. One, they do not take tissue samples from Gregory's heart, brain, bone marrow, kidneys, or liver. Such samples could have been used to confirm a diagnosis of drowning. Two, they do not send a sample of the water found in Gregory's lungs for further analysis. Years later, when the two doctors are asked to explain why they did not take these two critical steps, they both say that Judge Lambert expressly forbade them from doing so. They also say that they made it very clear to the judge at the time that these samples needed to be taken and the water needed to undergo analysis. Despite their many urgings, Judge Lambert said no. In trying to understand why the judge did not want the samples taken or the water tested, I've considered the following. Note that these are just my opinions, my own speculation, and they are in no way designed to excuse or attack Judge Lambert's behavior. One, maybe Judge Lambert had too many cases on his plate and didn't want to wait for more tests to be done to resolve the case. Two, early on in the investigation, Judge Lambert stated that the Gregory Villeman affair was a simple affair. Could it be that the judge failed to foresee how complicated the case would turn out to be? I will talk more about further analyses of Gregory's autopsy records, as well as subsequent tests that were done on the blood and lung samples in a later episode. For now, let me just say that additional experts who were brought into the investigation at various points throughout the years came up with slightly different conclusions about Gregory's time and cause of death. Five days after his death, Little Gregory is laid to rest with his beloved toy monkey, Kiki. Anywhere from 600 to 700 people descend on Les Ponges' small churchyard. The group consists of family, friends, members of the press, and members of law enforcement. The latter are there to scrutinize the faces and actions of family members. They know the crow, or crows, are likely among the sea of mourners, putting on a false face of grief and solemnity, maybe even offering an arm to Gregory's mother, Christine, who can barely stand. But no one gives themselves away. No one is observed trembling or nervous. Everyone looks the way mourners are supposed to look, serious, sad. The crow or crows are good actors. Inside the church, atop Gregory's small wood coffin, sits his portrait. In it, he is smiling that infectious, carefree grin. Hardly anyone is crying, at least not out loud. It's not until the end of the service, when Gregory's mother, Christine, breaks into tears, that sobbing is suddenly heard and white handkerchiefs are pulled out from pockets. After the service, the mourners shuffle out of the church and over to the adjacent cemetery. Gregory's paternal grandparents, Albert and Monique Villemain, are there, as well as his parents, Christine and Jean-Marie Villemain. Christine has both her arms wrapped around her husband's neck, hanging on for dear life. If she lets go, she will surely crumple to the ground. Once at the gravesite, as the diminutive coffin is lowered into the ground, Christine cries out in anguish, Gregory, come back. Why have they done this to you? She has to be carried out of the cemetery. Jean-Marie's mother, Monique, then faints, and she too must be carried out. Next time on Monsters in the Family, the assassination of little Gregory Villemain. We'll take a closer look at those in the Villemain's inner circle, both in the nuclear Villemain family 
as well as in the extended clan that the police initially focused their attention on and why those individuals may have had the motive deranged as it may have been to commit the heinous act i hope you'll join me